Welcome to the Maluli Asset Show. I'm your co-host today, Tom Maluli. This is episode number 369. Uh, who is that in the other window? I'm usually behind the camera. Uh, this is Tim Maluli. Haven't been in front of the camera for a while now, but uh, we're trying something new here. So this is the first co-hosted Maluli Asset Show. We're running this on a uh, program called Squadcast. Uh, they uh, advertise that they do things a little differently than Zoom. Um, Zoom apparently has some kind of lag feature, so it's good when you're speaking to a client over Zoom, but uh, not necessarily for recording or playback on a place like YouTube or on a website. So, Tim, We've just wrapped up January of 24 and people are starting to uh, go through their statements and they're looking at what the markets did last year. Let's talk about this. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, when you use the word market, I think it's important um, to, you know, talk about which market you're referring to because there are you know, you could be talking about the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the NASDAQ. Um, and depending on which one you're talking about, 2023 could have looked a lot different um, depending on how you were invested. I agree. And I also want to remind viewers that uh, your account or your investments may not be exactly 100% invested in the S&P 500. You may have a portfolio that is say 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds. It's hard to just look at the yardsticks and say, why didn't we see these kind of results? And right. we get these kind of questions in years where, you know, the year just ended was pretty good. So, the S&P 500 returned 24% in 2023. Uh, I wish they had returned 23% because it would be easier to remember 23% yeah. in 23. But they did 24% in 2023. But that's not what everybody is going to get. Yeah, I, I feel like people sometimes will hear that headline number if they're you know talking on the radio or CNBC. And be like, well, I didn't make twenty four percent. Why didn't Why didn't I make twenty four percent? But you know, like you said, if you own any sort of fixed income or you're not one hundred percent in the stock market, you know, you're going to have different returns from what the S and P five hundred did. And you know, if your stock portion of the account isn't fully invested in the S and P five hundred, you're going to have different returns as well. Um, you know, the S and P five hundred is just U S large cap stocks. Uh, so if you're invested in any other type of, you know, mid cap stocks, small cap stocks, uh, growth, value, momentum, any, you slice it up any way you want. If you're not fully 100% in that S&P 500, you're not going to capture the entire upside, downside in any given year of what that index does. So that also means that if you, um, called up your advisor or logged into your account in say March of 2023 when Silicon Valley Bank was going under and you decided that this was the end of the world and you put all of your money on the sidelines in cash, there's no way that you got these kinds of results. No, definitely not. I mean, and we have numbers here, even just to dig inside of the S&P 500 a little bit. Um, the S&P 500 uh, is a cap weighted index. So the larger stocks in the S&P 500 pull more of the returns. Uh, so that's not necessarily the largest price stocks. Right. It's the largest capitalized companies. Cap, it, they're stacked by cap weighting. Right. So that index was up 24%, like you mentioned. But if you were to equal weight the S&P 500, so every single stock, all 500 stocks in the S&P are weighted exactly the same, that index was only up 11.5%. Uh, so what that says is that some of these stocks within the cap-weighted S&P 500 were really pulling the ship 
Uh, and if you weren't fully invested in those stocks to those full weightings, you underperformed uh, what that index did. So you'll also see that the same names that were pulling the train, so to speak, with the S&P 500 were also pulling the NASDAQ. And so the next logical question that we get from people is, well, hey, if the cap weighted index that includes all of these large cap names, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, all of those names, if they are, in it, why don't we just own them all the time? Yeah, and in a year where they're going up gangbusters, that's a fair question to ask. Um, yeah. But, you know, those same stocks, um, the ETF that tracks the, the NASDAQ uh, 100 stocks is QQQ. Uh, that, that fund was also down 33% in 2002. And the individual stocks that you're talking about, uh, some of these huge growth technology companies, um, you know, if you were to own them individually, you'd have to eat 50, 60, 70 percent drawdowns in those bad years to then hold on and recapture all of the gains that they made in a year like 2023. So, so it's uh, it's a roller coaster ride. It really is. And let's let's use use this in some dollar terms so it'll help people understand at the end of 2020. Two, if you, I'm sorry, at the end of 2021, if you had a hundred dollars in the NASDAQ index or even the S&P 500 cap weighted index, if the NASDAQ goes down 33%, your hundred dollars at the end of 22 is now $67. Right. If the NASDAQ returns 40% in the following year in 2023, your $67 has grown to almost $94. Right. You're not even back to even. Yeah, you haven't even round tripped yet. Right. So that that speaks to you know, the benefits of diversification and not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Because sure, you could own just those companies individually, or you could just own just the S&P 500 for your stock exposure. Um, but all of these different types of investments, mid caps, small caps, large caps, um, international versus US, they perform differently at different times and it can smooth out the ride a little bit. So in years in like 2023, where the market goes up quite a bit, you might not capture 100% of that, but in years where the S&P or the NASDAQ is going down, like in 2022, if you're diversified in other areas, you might not capture all of that all downside of that as well. Downside, right? All of that drop as yeah. well. So uh, it's important to know that when um, historians, when they're talking about the stock market, depending on which yardstick they're using, over 90 years, over 50 years, wh whatever yardstick, when they say that the market has returned 9% on average per year, or in some cases 10% on average per year, that includes a down year of 25%. That's yeah. already baked into the cake. Those numbers are already in there, but you're never going to get those numbers if you're hopping in and out of the different baskets and saying, I want to go to cash because I'm, I'm worried about the economy. Yeah. Yeah. It speaks to having an allocation that you can stick with through good times and bad. So just on a short-term basis, uh, one of the things that we pointed out to clients in the summer of last year, just six months ago, there was a point in time where the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which finished up 16% for the year, there was a point in time in the summer where the Dow Jones was up 1.5%. Yeah. Yeah. So even just, you know, within the span of a 12-month period, you know, if you're if you're not in at the right times or, you know, you're you're trying to time things, you could miss a pretty much the entire return for an entire year over the span of a couple months. Yeah. So it's important to have an allocation that you don't feel the need to constantly tweak. Right. Yeah. You got to the money that's going to compound long term has to be left long term. That's, yeah. That really is the answer. And that's the message for episode 369. Thanks, as always, for tuning in, and we're going to continue to tinker with this new method of doing uh, videos and podcasts.